We'll uh, get started. Uh, important announcement is today I'm going to uh, post a quiz on Carmen. So uh, uh, I think I'll make sure that the due date is one week from now. So next week, Tuesday, next week, uh, Wednesday. Uh, it'll be a one hour quiz. Uh, you can uh, you can take the quiz twice. The average of the two, the two scores will be counted towards the marks of the quiz. And that quiz is based on lecture one to four. So whatever we are going to do today, like matrices and stuff, that's all included as part of the quiz. So we have done uh, chain rule, we have done Taylor series, uh, we've done sequences. So all of that is part of the quiz that uh, will be posted today. And so we'll have another quiz next week and another quiz next to next week. So I make sure that you guys understand the foundations of the optimization very well before we start doing more complicated stuff in October and November. So today, uh, I have two topics in mind. One is matrices, specifically symmetric matrices, positive definite, positive semi-definite matrices. So I want to introduce those matrices to you. And then I want to talk about convex functions and convex sets. So let's start with matrices. So I have a matrix A. which is uh, the way we represent a matrix is by saying that the matrix lies in our n cross m. A square matrix has n equals to m. So then we call it a square matrix. And there is a very special subclass of square matrices called symmetric matrices. where A is equal to A transpose. When you think about matrix, what is the first thing that comes to the mind? What's a cool thing you might have studied about matrices before? Eigenvalues, okay. <coughs> So we take lambda i minus a, we take the determinant of this matrix where lambda is a, a, a scalar variable. So this is a polynomial of degree n. And this is a polynomial in lambda, okay? So whenever we take determinant of lambda i minus a or da determinant of a minus lambda i, it doesn't matter which one you pick, you get a polynomial of degree n. Uh, you can solve this polynomial of degree n to get the roots of this polynomial. So roots of determinant lambda i minus a are called eigenvalues of A. Okay. So we get a polynomial of degree n. We find out what the roots of this polynomial is. Some of those roots could be uh, could be complex for a general matrix A, for a general square matrix A, some of these roots could be, uh, it could be complex numbers. So there are possibilities where eigenvalues of A could be complex numbers. But for symmetric matrices, these roots are always real. So if A is symmetric, then eigenvalues are real. They are not complex. It could be positive, it could be negative. 
but at least they are real eigenvalues. Okay, any questions so far? Now, A is called singular if one of the eigenvalue is zero. There exists an eigenvalue such that that eigenvalue is equal to zero. A is a singular matrix. Let me call this eigenvalues lambda one to lambda n. We have n, n eigenvalues of A lambda one to lambda n. Yes. For the case of the singular matrix. Yes. So the lambda r equal to zero. Does it mean all lambda? Not all, just one. There exists one eigenvalue such that that eigenvalue is zero. Okay. You could have multiple eigenvalues that are zero. That's fine. But at least one eigenvalue has to be zero. Then it's called a singular matrix. So non-singular matrices are invertible, which means that you can find out A inverse. So if A is non-singular, then A is invertible. A, A inverse equals to A inverse A equals to the identity matrix. Questions? I'm sure all of you have uh, done this exercise before where you are given a matrix and you need to compute A inverse. Uh, nowadays, of course, MATLAB, Python, all of, these uh, all of these programming languages have inbuilt packages to compute inverse of matrices. Sometimes for simple matrices, of course, uh, inverse is not an issue, but many a times in optimization you might encounter uh, situations where your A could be a million cross million dimensional or billion cross billion dimensional, and then computing A inverse becomes a problem. But for all practical purposes, um, where uh, in this particular course, A will be nice, simple, 10 cross 10, 20 cross 20, 50 cross 50 matrix, and so inversion of such a matrix is not a problem. But that may not be the case if you happen to go to Google or Facebook or whatever, because you might get into problem where you have to have very high dimensional matrices inverse. I'll take his question first and I'll come to you. Right, so that's, that's, uh, we'll talk about eigenvectors in a bit. So eigenfunctions and eigenvectors are similar. Uh, so eigenfunctions are used for linear operators, we are not talking about linear operators here, we are talking about matrices, so we talk about eigenvectors. But uh, eigenfunctions is, the more math you know, everything becomes very simple, so. <laughs> but for that you have to go through a lot of math classes. So you will study about eigenfunctions if you go to uh, a class in functional analysis. What would be the intuitive meaning of eigenvalue? Intuitive meaning of? Eigenvalue. Uh, so the intuitive meaning of eigenvalue is that if you take lambda i multiplied by an identity matrix subtracted from A, then A becomes singular. 
So A is a, no a you start with a non-singular matrix, you subtract the eigenvalue times the identity matrix, then it becomes a singular, and then it has a null space, it has a non-trivial null space. And that non-trivial null space is known as eigenvector, which is how I'll introduce it in the class. Yes? I was gonna ask, is there an intuitive way to think of how um, the complexity of an inversion would scale with the dimensions? I think it is very well known. If you go to Wikipedia, it tells you how many operations are needed okay. to invert a matrix, and depending on the uh, algorithm you use for matrix inverse, uh, I think you have different complexity. So the one that you use in math classes, which is sort of the easy way of doing the matrix inverse, I think it has n cube complexity or something, and then the best algorithm I think is n raised to 2.36 or something like that, some complicated algorithm, so yeah. And many a times, again, not part of this class, but sometimes you don't want the exact inverse of the matrix, even if you have an approximate inverse of the matrix, then you're kind of happy with it. Uh, so for approximate inversion, there is like a whole bunch of algorithms and they have different complexities and so on. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, I think the best algorithm is 2.3, n raised to 2.36 is the complexity. But I could be wrong, sorry? Is that what MATLAB uses or? I don't think that's what MATLAB uses. Uh, I don't know which one MATLAB would use, but uh, uh, see, when you're talking about complexity of algorithms, you also have to talk about the memory complexity and the computational complexity. So depend, so you have like a whole bunch of algorithms and they'll have different memory complexity and different algorithmic complexity. So yeah, it's, it's a very vast field. Okay, any other question? Okay, so uh, eigenvectors. So remember with that uh, determinant of lambda i minus a is equal to zero because lambda i is a root of this particular polynomial. So recall which means that there exists a vector vi is an rn oh actually i have written rn but uh, in the general case, it could be a complex vector too. So let me use the complex number for now. Such that this holds true, which means A V I equals to lambda I V I. So another way to think about an eigenvector vi, so this vi is known as the eigenvector of the matrix A. And another way to think about eigenvector vi is if you multiply vi with the matrix A, then that particular vector gets stretched by a factor lambda i. So that stretching or shrinking happens dependent on what the eigenvalue, corresponding eigenvalue of that matrix is. So each of these lambda i's will have a different, may have a different vi. I mean, uh, not may, I think it should have a different vi. So if you have lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, all the way up to lambda n, you will have uh, different vi's. In most of the situations, there are of course corner cases, uh, but for the purpose of this course, uh, I think in, when you take a course in linear algebra, you will understand more about this concept of eigenvalues and eigenvectors and under what conditions eigenvectors exist and do not exist and so on and so forth. But for the purposes of this class, we don't want to deal with all the corner cases of uh, 
those uh, situations. So um, we'll just uh, assume that whatever matrix we are studying, it will have a eigenvector corresponding to each eigenvalue. And this is the relationship that will be satisfied uh, for those eigenvector eigenvalue pair. Now another cool thing is similarity transform. So I can define a matrix B by this particular uh, expression. Should I write SAS inverse or S inverse AS? SAS inverse, that's fine. S is any non-singular matrix of dimension N cross N. Then the eigenvalues of B will be the same as eigenvalues of A. So this is known as similarity transform and eigenvalues of B is same as eigenvalues of A. So multiplying by a matrix and its inverse doesn't really change the eigenvalues of the matrix A. What are the conditions again for S? It just has to be a non-singular, invertible matrix, because you have to take the inverse on this side. Okay. Spectral radius. So rho of A, rho is called the spectral radius of the matrix A, is the maximum of the absolute value of eigenvalues of A. So I pick all the eigenvalues, so eigenvalues could be real number, it could be complex number, I take the absolute value of those complex numbers, I take the maximum of those absolute values, that gives me the spectral radius of the matrix A. That's called the spectral radius of the matrix A. That's just a definition. Uh, so spectral radius of a matrix A, you have like n eigenvalues, you take the absolute value of those n eigenvalues, you take the maximum of those absolute values, that gives you the spectral radius of the matrix A. Okay. So what is the uh, idea of the spectral radius? Well, if you have a matrix A, you multiply it by vector V, you take the norm of this particular vector, it will always be less than or equal to rho of A times V. Now one thing I need to check is, do I need to add a little bit? No, actually, uh, that may not necessarily be correct. I'll have to pick a specific. Actually, I'm going to make a small change here and then qualify this statement a little bit better. So actually, let me start with the matrix norm. So erase this part, we'll get to it in a bit. Let me talk about the matrix norm first. So matrix norm is max over all vectors V not equal to zero 
ए वी ओवर वी सो आई पिक ऑल नॉन जीरो वैक्टर मल्टीप्लाइड बाय मेट्रिक्स ए इन द न्यूमरेटर टेक द नॉम सो दिस नॉम कुड बी एनी ऑफ द नॉम यू पिक राइट सो वी टॉक्ड अबाउट Infinity norm, we have talked about LP norm, L2 norms, L1 norm. You can pick whatever is your favorite norm there. And this is known as a matrix norm. And a well-known result is for every epsilon greater than zero. I'll write it as a fact. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a norm such that norm of A is less than equal to is less than rho A plus epsilon. So for every epsilon greater than zero, I can find a matrix norm such that the matrix norm is less than the spectral radius plus epsilon. And because of this particular way of defining matrix norm, we have A V is less than equal to norm of A times norm of V. This is just by definition. So that's the relationship between the spectral radius or the eigenvalues of the matrix A and how it behaves when you multiply it to a vector when you multiply the matrix to a vector how does that uh, behave in terms of the norm of that particular new vector that you got How do you? Uh, this is vi. This is an eigenvector. This is just a generic vector in Rn. Okay. Yes. Oh, you are not able to see it. Okay. This one. Uh, here, what I have written is. A B is less than or equal to norm of A, norm of V, and this one actually is by definition of this matrix norm. And what I was mentioning is that this matrix norm and the spectral radius that I defined there is uh, the relationship is basically given by this fact, which is that for every epsilon greater than zero. You can always find a matrix norm such that uh, the matrix norm is less than rho a plus epsilon. Another cool fact, interesting fact, is if you perturb the matrix a little bit, the eigenvalues also get perturbed only a little bit. So eigenvalues is a continuous function of the entries of a matrix. So if I perturb the matrix entries by a little bit, if matrix has three and I perturb it to 3.1, the eigenvalues will not move too much. If the eigenvalues was two and five, it'll become 2.02 and 5.61, not six one, sorry, six one is a big change, 5.05, something like that. Let's go back to the discussion on symmetric matrices. So, so 
So we already mentioned that for symmetric matrices, the eigenvalues are real. real numbers, but it also turns out that the eigenvectors of symmetric matrices are orthogonal to each other. That is Vi transpose Vj equals to 0 if i is not equal to j. So that's a cool fact about symmetric matrices that the eigenvalues are all orthogonal to each other. Yes. Sorry. Uh, can you explain a little bit like uh, V is a single vector, right? Why are we taking the maximum over a single vector? V is not a single vector. So I can pick, uh, so here it's a single vector. But now I'm looking at all possible V's in the space as long as V is non-zero. So right, so, okay. So here is how to think about it. So this is my V1. Okay, I multiply it by A. This is my AV1, okay. Here is my V2. I multiply it by A, I get A V2. Uh, now imagine you can take billions of such Vs all over the place and you will have different values of A V1, A V2 and so on, different norms of A V1, A V2. I am taking the maximum of all those ratios in all the billions and billions of directions that this V can potentially take as long as it's non-zero. So V is not at the origin. This is not the vector V we are looking at. But everywhere around this origin, we are looking at all possible Vs. We are looking at this ratio, and then we are taking the maximum of that ratio. That gives me the matrix norm A. Any other question? Okay, I'll go a little slower so that you have time to digest. Okay, so when you look at symmetric matrices, you have real eigenvalues, your eigenvectors are orthogonal. Let's assume that each of these eigenvectors are also unit norm, so let's assume We have picked the eigenvector V. Which basically means that the L2 norm is equal to one for all I. And then I create a matrix capital V So I created this matrix V and it turns out that this particular V uh, satisfies V, V transpose equals to V transpose V equals to identity. That's another property of symmetric matrices. Okay, any other, any questions on this? Yes. So when you write your, the matrix for V and you have the individual 
those v1 v2 are they all um, vectors or column vectors they're all yeah, yeah. The v1, vectors v2, are they row vectors or they are all column vectors all vectors are column vectors in this class okay so these are all column vectors these are all column vectors and now i'm stacking those column vectors as columns of a matrix i get a matrix which is an n cross n matrix So each of this is n dimensional column vector and then I get an n cross n matrix and that matrix satisfies this condition. And those v vectors are eigenvectors. These are all eigenvectors. These are all eigenvectors of this symmetric matrix A. Any other question? Yes. So uh, back to that eigenvector relationship, A, B equals lambda V. That's right. So uh, can you think of it like, basically, if you apply the transformation A onto the eigenvector, then all it will do is scale the eigenvector. That's, yeah. Eigenvector. That's exactly what it does. Okay. And in the case of symmetric matrices, uh, the eigenvectors are stretched only in the real along the real line, right? Because sometimes you've got a, your eigenvectors, eigenvalues could be complex. So a lot of those discussions, for a general matrix, that discussion will happen in a complex plane and a complex, um, com complex n-dimensional vectors. But in this case, uh, all of it is happening on the real Euclidean space. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I'm missing anything. I want to do a simple, let's do a very simple uh, example. So let's say, uh, not an example, but I want to cover a, a, another cool property of symmetric matrix. Not sure whether it will be useful or not, but uh, it just helps us think better. So let's say my lambda 1 is less than equal to lambda 2 is less than equal to lambda n. And that lambda n is the, uh, is, let's say, and let's assume that lambda n I'm trying to think well I don't need to order them at all I can just let it be like this so let's assume that lambda n is such that lambda n is equal to the spectral radius of the symmetric matrix A Then the matrix norm of A, the two matrix norm, will actually be will be equal to row A. And the way to see it is as follows. No matter what vector you pick, uh, If you look at AX, then it is so norm of AX two norm is equal to. alpha 1, lambda 1,
Okay, so I don't know how many how many steps you follow, but I'll let you think about it. Does it look correct? The B here are unit norms. Unit? Yeah, these are all unit norms. So I take the two norm, I pick a vector x, I can always decompose it, so these forms the orthonormal basis for Rn. So I can decompose x in the form of alpha 1, v1 plus alpha 2, v2 and so on. So my a times x is alpha 1 multiplied by a times v1, so that becomes lambda 1, v1. Same thing happens alpha 2, lambda 2, v2 and all the way up to alpha n, lambda n, vn. Then I take the two norm and remember that vi transpose vj is equal to zero. So if I take the inner product of this, this vector with itself, all the cross terms between vi and v1 transpose v2, v2 transpose v3, all of those cross terms will be equal to zero. And v1 transpose v1 will be equal to one because by definition vi's have unit norm. So all I am left with is absolute value of alpha 1 to la times lambda 1 and so on. So if I pick, now the question is if I divide it by the norm of x, what is the norm of x here? You know, am I, I think I'm making a mistake here. This should be square, right? And then there should be a square root. I think that was the mistake I was making. Does this look correct? Does, does this look uh, correct? I think it does. So I have alpha 1 square, lambda 1 square. And V1 transpose V1 is equal to 1. So that's why I have alpha 1 square, lambda 1 square here. And it goes all the way here. And same thing, norm of x is square root of alpha n square. So if I want to find the matrix norm, let me erase this thing here. Yeah. Question? Yeah, just it talks. Um, I don't like looking at the last equation you wrote. Uh -huh. So my thinking is if it's supposed to be alpha 1, lambda 1, then put uh, an absolute square. We don't really need an absolute value there. No, I'm just using the uh, definition for the uh, A2 norm, right? Uh -huh. So I'm like, is if it's supposed to be alpha one, lambda one, both in the absolute um, bracket then squared, instead of separating both. I didn't understand your question. So uh, you don't want the absolute value there, or you want the absolute value there? I want both items inside one absolute value. But it doesn't matter because these are all real numbers, and I'm squaring these real numbers. So square is positive anyways. It doesn't matter whether you put absolute value around it or not. OK? Any other question? So if you look at the matrix norm, it is max over all alpha 1 to alpha n of square root of alpha 1 square lambda 1 square plus alpha n square lambda n square over square root of alpha 1 square plus alpha n square. And this is the two norm by the way because I'm using the two norm here and I'm using the two norm here. Okay, so I'm using the two norm here and the two norm here. So I get this, and it turns out that the maximum value will occur when you pick alpha n equals to one, alpha n equals to one, and all the other alphas equals to zero. And so you will get lambda n 
as the 2 norm of A, which is equal to the spectral radius of A. And the reason why alpha n equals to 1 is because lambda n, absolute value of lambda n is the highest, eigen, is the largest eigenvalue of the matrix A. So all of these lambda 1 square, lambda 2 square, all of these are small values in comparison to lambda n square. So they do have to be ordered the way you order them? No, it doesn't need to be ordered. Just that lambda n has to be the largest eigenvalue. That's pretty much it. This is only for symmetric matrices. So symmetric matrix, this is automatic, this is automatic, and we are assuming that VI is our unit norm. We can always pick eigenvectors that are unit norm for any matrix. Okay, so VI is in, like, VI is and VN are orthogonal. Correct. That's because A is symmetric. So if for a symmetric matrix, all eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. Okay. And, and like, can you once again explain how did you get matrix norm to be um, uh, Yeah, so we are doing the derivation here. So we started with a symmetric matrix A. We know that the eigenvectors are all orthogonal to each other. We picked all the unit eigenvectors. Now I want to show that the matrix norm of A with respect to the L2 norm is actually equal to the spectral radius of matrix A. So let's assume for the purpose of this calculation that absolute value of lambda n is equal to the spectral radius of matrix A. Just so that my life is easier with respect to notation. Now I pick a vector x and I can always decompose it in this particular way because v1 to vn are orthogonal to each other. These are n orthogonal vectors, so I can always decompose x in this particular manner. Then if I multiply a with x, I get this vector. Norm of x is given by this quantity. Norm of ax is given by this quantity. So you have a question in going from this step to this step? Okay, so let's do that. I think that's why doing this was a good exercise because then you can think in terms of matrices. X transpose X equals to alpha 1 square B1 transpose V1, alpha 1 alpha 2 B1 transpose V2, alpha 2 alpha 1 V2 transpose V1 alpha 2 square v2 transpose v2 and so on, right? You agree with this statement? Now all this cross term of v2 transpose v1, what is v2 transpose v1? Zero, right? So all these cross terms will go to zero. And what will be, what is v1 transpose v1? That's a unit norm vector, right? So they are all equal to one. So what I'll be left with is alpha one square plus alpha n square, that's it. All the other cross terms will be zero. <coughs> Sorry? Yeah, alpha ones are scalar. Okay, alpha ones are scalar. These alphas are all scalar. Remember how we compute this alpha? So alpha i, is equal to VI transpose X. <coughs> okay, we did this in the first class, by the way. So when you have an orthogonal vector and you want to find out what's the component of X, you just do this V1 transpose X and v VI transpose X and you get the value of alpha I. So these are all scalar and then you get this as matrix, matrix norm, uh, sorry, the, the vector norm here this is AX, or the norm of AX is given by this expression. Then you do the division, you take the ratio, and then you maximize over all alpha 1 to alpha n. It'll turn out that the maximizing value will be alpha 1 equals to 0, alpha 2 equals to 0, and alpha n equals to 1. That'll give you the maximizing value. 
which is equal to the spectral radius of the matrix A. And that proves that the two norm of this square matrix, symmetric matrix, is equal to the spectral radius of the matrix A. Okay. Uh, any other question? This one? Yeah, this so if you do this maximization, which you know we haven't learned how to do the maximization, but we'll learn very soon. If you do this maximization, you will realize that the maximum is achieved when alpha n equals to one, and all the other vectors are zero. All the other terms are zero. And that's because lambda n is the largest value. Yes? Is the L2 norm here uh, exchangeable with Frobenius norm, or is this a different concept? Uh, this is a matrix. R right, so uh, this is the matrix 2 norm, but not the L2 norm. L2 norm is only defined for vectors, not for matrices. Okay, so this is the matrix norm, which is induced by the L2 norm, right? So you can pick any norm here, that will be the corresponding A norm. And then, I, again, not for this particular course, but sometimes you might have different norm here and a different norm here. And then that will be called the operator norm. Okay? Um, so, the, like for instance, if it is P norm here and Q norm here, and this is denoted by A, P, Q. But that's, again, we don't study that in this class, but that's also one way to define the matrix norm. Okay. So what's the sequence of the lambda 1 to lambda n? Is the lambda n the largest? Uh, the only constraint here is lambda n is the largest, okay. largest uh, no, uh, eigenvalue. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so we'll uh, talk about uh, positive definite matrices now. I'm going to erase uh, this side of the board. So A is a positive definite matrix if and only if A is symmetric and X transpose AX is strictly positive for all X not equal to zero. And positive semi-definite This one? No. Uh, if, and only if. if and only if this one, which is A symmetric holds, and X transpose AX is greater than or equal to zero for all X in RN. Question? Oh, I'm sorry. Is this the x uh, vector? Is the also this x is a vector. Uh, yeah, but I want to know if that's the uh, I'm not sure. Uh, 
What is your question? Orthogonal? No, I mean x is not orthogonal. x is just any vector. For all x in Rn, x transpose Ax has to be non-negative. Then it's a positive semi-definite. It is positive definite if this is strictly greater than 0 for all x not equal to 0. x, of course, is an Rn also here. OK? And a simple result, uh, again from matrix theory, is uh, if lambda 1 to lambda n is strictly positive, then A is positive definite. And if lambda 1 to lambda n is greater than or equal to 0, then A is positive, semi-definite. Okay, this is a fact, this is a result which can be derived from this definition. So A is symmetric, so all of these eigenvalues have to be real numbers. Now if these eigenvalues happen to be strictly positive, then A is a positive definite matrix. If these eigenvalues happen to be strictly well, no, it's non-negative, which means that it is greater than or equal to zero. Then A is positive def semi-definite matrix. Okay. So if one of the eigenvalue is zero, then there is a null space, as a result of which x transpose A x can be zero even for non-zero x. Positive definite matrix will play a very crucial role throughout the optimization class. And positive semi-definite matrices will cause problems throughout the optimization class. So we'll always be worried about, uh, whenever we see positive semi-definite matrix, we become worried. And then we try to massage the problem in a way that we get a positive definite matrix, then we are all happy and then we proceed with the optimization algorithm. So that will be the rest of the, the semester for us, where we only worry about positive semi-definite matrices and we always try to get a positive definite matrices. So this thing will be recurring theme within the entire semester. Uh, yeah. Is there a usefulness or like an analog for negative definite or negative semi-definite? Uh, uh, right, okay. So in optimization, we always solve the uh, minimization problem. So we worry about positive definite and positive semi-definite matrix. But instead, if the optimization class was about maximizing, then we worry about negative definite and negative semi-definite matrices. So, um, so we are only talking about minimizing. Uh, and whenever you have a maximum problem, you multiply the function with a negative sign, then you become a minimizing problem. And then we solve the rest of the uh, problem according to a minimization problem. So that's why we only talk about positive definite and semi-definite matrices. Any other question? Yes. Correct. Correct. And then does that mean that the A is what kind of a, a special matrix? Which one? V? A? A? Yeah, yeah. No. So no matter what what eigenvector you pick, I can always pick another eigenvector V over norm of V, and that eigenvector becomes a unit norm. What I mean is that because uh, these, uh, these eigenvectors are from the uh, matrix A. Correct. So um, they are unit norm. Right. So does that mean that uh, that A is some no, there's no, there's, that's what I'm saying, that A doesn't have to have any special property. No matter what eigenvector I pick, I can always divide by the norm of the eigenvector to get a unit norm eigenvector. So the new eigenvector is also the... the it's also, this is also an eigenvector of the matrix, of but it, it happens to have a unit norm. Okay. So you multiply an eigenvector by any scalar, it still remains an eigenvector.
It's still the eigenvector. It's still an eigenvector. Okay, that's pretty much it. I'll talk about convex functions and convex sets in the next class and we'll jump into optimization after that. Thank you.